Jenny's current exhibition is A Lasting Imprint, Rendering Rhythm and Motion in the Art of Black Mountain College, and it'll be on loan from the Asheville Art Museum through Sunday, May 2nd. So I hope you all will make your free reservation to come and see it in person, or you can view the online gallery guide at knoxart.org under the exhibitions page. And now to introduce our speaker, Hilary Schroeder is the assistant curator at the Asheville Art Museum, and she began with the museum in 2018 as a curatorial assistant and the loose project coordinator, managing the reinstallation of the collection and publication, Asheville Art Museum, an introduction to the collection. Hillary organized a lasting imprint, rendering rhythm and motion in the art of Black Mountain College, currently at the KMA, and is coordinating the Asheville Art Museum's presentation of Buford Delaney's Metamorphosis into Freedom, curated by KMA's Stephen Wicks. She received a BA in art history from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, and an MA in art history from the University of Georgia. Outside of work hours, you'll find her taking ballet or Pilates on Zoom in her kitchen, borrowing a friend's outdoor rig to play on her trapeze, or trying to make bread in an effort to redirect her love of baking cookies. Please welcome Hilary Schroeder. I'm excited to be back with uh, the KMA crew for uh, another presentation on this exhibition that I am just so excited that we've been able to share with you all to, to get our materials about uh, related to Black Mountain College out into the world. Um, we're really excited to be sort of sharing with a local institution, a, you know, peer institution at the Knoxville Museum of Art and exchanging exhibitions. We're really excited to be getting the Buford Delaney works uh, next week. So if you happen to be in Asheville, I hope you'll come see some of your home institution materials here on our walls. Um, so the exhibition that is on view at the Knoxville Museum of Art right now is focused on sort of movement and music, because I know that Knoxville has had the um, Big Ears Music Festival for quite a few years. And so when Stephen came to us sort of with this idea to do a trade, he mentioned that Big Ears was a big part of this time of year. And um, obviously it hasn't happened as, you know, it normally does, but we thought that was a great jumping off point for an exhibition. Uh, so I hope that you've been able to go experience um, either online through that gallery guide or in person the ways that um, the exhibition explores things like music and rhythm and dance through this very interdisciplinary um, experience that was Black Mountain College. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, though I think is foundational to that very interdisciplinary approach that um, the exhibition highlights. And that is the influence of Yosef and Ani Albers at um, Black Mountain College during their time there. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of Black Mountain College for those of you who uh, are not familiar with it or maybe need a little refresher. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the way that they influenced people who studied and worked alongside them, uh, specifically looking at some of the objects in the exhibition. So if you've been able to see them in person or online, now is a little bit of a closer look at those particular objects. So um, I'm going to get my chat box up too, just in case anyone wants to drop anything in there. Come on, chat box. Where are you? There you are. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's go ahead and get rolling. So just to give a quick overview of Black Mountain College for those of you who are new to it, um, Black Mountain College was a, truly an experiment in what higher education could look like. It was founded in 1933 by John Andrew Rice and a group of fellow folks from Rollins College down in Florida who really weren't kind of feeling what was happening with the administration and the style of teaching there and wanted to come and try something a little bit new. Um, really inspired particularly by John Dewey and um, 
progressivism, which I'll talk about more in a second. And um, so they went up to Black Mountain, North Carolina, and kind of looked for a site that would host their sort of vision that they had for this college. And so they settled in um, Black Mountain at the Blue Ridge Assembly in 1933. And the college remained there until 1941. And in 1941, it moved to Lake Eden just across the way. And that site was actually a site that was custom built as opposed to ready made. I'll have images of those so you can get a sense of the place that Black Mountain College happened at. But um, those are sort of two ways that you know we kind of divide up thinking about Black Mountain College, whether it was at the assembly or at Lake Eden. Um, and then there were a couple of different eras that are key based on the leadership. So from 1933 to 1940, John Rice served as the rector. Uh, and then in 1940 to 1949, Joseph Albers took over. And that's a pretty key period for some pretty important and big changes that happened in sort of art making, you'll see a lot of objects were from that time period. Um, in 1953, poet Charles Olson took over as rector. And from 1953 to 1956, there was really a shift sort of away from the visual arts that had really dominated the school from 1940 to 1949, and a shift more towards an interest in ecrastic poetry and writing, although the arts certainly remained a part of that time period without a doubt. And then in 1957, Black Mountain College closed. So a very short period of time um, that the college actually existed. And it really, amazing things happened that we we're going to look at through these materials, but ultimately it kind of had to shut down for a variety of reasons, such as finances, which were always an issue, um, leadership changes. Um, but out of this, these amazing ideals really kind of came about and still propagate today. So John uh, Rice was really bringing this idea of pragmatism and progressivism, a hands-on experiential approach to the experience of Black Mountain College. And this is gonna be important when talking about the way the Alberses approached education because they really sort of went in on this idea with um, John Rice and, and Theodore Dreyer, who also um, was one of those co-founders. And he's important because if you've been to see the exhibition, there are some ephemeral materials that are part of our collection and those came from Theodore Dreyer um, that he had collected over the years. So an important figure both to our collection and to the college at large. Uh, to, to give a sense of, of kind of the, the ethos of the college, um, this is text from the very first Black Mountain College catalog in 1933. Um, and I'll just read a, a little bit of it. I won't read the whole thing, but just to give you a sense of it. Um, Black Mountain College was founded in order to provide a place where free use might be made of tested and proved methods of education and new methods tried out in a purely experimental spirit. Right? So this idea of coming at something with a sense of experimentation and um, doing something a little bit different, even within kind of what had been done before, right? They didn't totally throw out academia entirely, but they uh, still, you know, wanted to, to move on to new ideas and new ways of doing things. So um, this is an image of the first site of Black Mountain College at the Blue Ridge Assembly. And I think it's important to get a sense of where the place was, particularly when we're talking about Ani and Josef Albers, because they came from Germany in 1933 to rural North Carolina, um, which is a pretty big difference to, to, to go from sort of major cities to come to this smaller area. And even Asheville, which is 15 miles away, was not that big at the time either. Um, so this was the setting and it is up on the side of a mountain. I was actually just there the other day with some of my colleagues doing some research for an upcoming exhibition. And um, we actually went to the room that they stayed in. So they lived in a room here up on the third floor and um, actually had a little corner room too that they would let guests stay in. So you can get a sense of where they were. Um, so classes happen mainly in this building here. This was the dining hall, it's no longer standing. And then this building here, um, college hall, uh, which is is an auditorium with classrooms up above. So to get a sense of this like amazing place in nature, Greek revival style. Um, the college saw approximately 1200 students over the course of its existence, but only about 60 actually graduated. Um, there were famously not 
technically grades um, and students sort of, you know, set their own plan for graduation or for coursework. They were assessed by outside assessors sort of as one would um, expect. Um, but a lot of folks kind of would just come in for a semester or for a summer or they'd come back a couple times over the course of years. Uh, so they started off at the Blue Ridge Assembly and this was really a, a great ready-made campus. They didn't have to build anything. They were running on minimal funds. And that's important to remember throughout their entire existence of the college. Um, you know, they start in 1933 and really kind of in that Great Depression period and then go through the war years and the post-war years. And this here is the studies building at Lake Eden. And this building was designed by, um, oh, uh, Lawrence Coker, sort of in the spirit of the German architect, uh, Walter Gropius. And um, it was on this 667 acre property uh, and they bought that property in 1937. They didn't move into 1941 because they were actually as student and staff building the buildings there together. And that's another important part of the Black Mountain College experience was that there was not a lot of hierarchy. So students and professors and visitors were all sort of working side by side. There was a farm um, where they all worked together. Students were you know, expected to partake in, in building the campus and maintaining the campus and feeding and preparing food. And, you know, it was a very sort of egalitarian thing and a lot of decisions were made. And in some ways, I think that was probably why it was not a sustainable structure, right? You do sometimes need leadership to keep things going long term. But um, it, it, it was part of sort of what was magical about the fact that many people could come together to have these sort of very radical and progressive ideas at the time. And I think you'll see that play out in some of the ways that the Albers is taught. Um, so here we've got uh, Joseph and Ani Albers at the 1944 Summer Institute, photographed by uh, Barbara Morgan, who is famed for her pictures of Martha Graham. You might be familiar with her through that, but also stopped in for a summer session in 1944. Um, and next to them is the Bauhaus building in Dessau, which both of them taught at. Um, they were there for quite some time. They were, uh, Joseph was technically a, a master, um, a Bauhaus master, and Ani uh, was running the weaving shop there. Um, now at Black Mountain College, it was not just an art college, although we often like to sort of focus on that part of it, but they also taught a lot of other different things. You could take physics classes, you would take math classes, you would take foreign language classes. There was of course music and theater and dance. And so um, this idea of integrating art with other elements of your education was really important, right? Interdisciplinarity, the meeting of many different sort of lines of thought or areas of study, in case that's a word that's a little new. It's a really long word too. So, um, But they came from this context of being at the Bauhaus, which was really um, sort of a revolution in design and aesthetics in modern European art. And had a huge influence on American modernism and specifically part of the legacy of Black Mountain College and of the Albers is the teachings that they brought with them from the Bauhaus to Black Mountain and then later on to when um, they were teaching, well, when um, Albers was teaching at Yale as the, the department head there. So I like to connect this um, sort of graphic from the Bauhaus to Black Mountain College, because I think it underscores some of the things that were shared between the two institutions. So this is sort of a thing that works its way out and then into more specific. So you take a basic course at the, the Bauhaus where you would study materials, um, and then you get a little more specific and you'd start to look at nature and tools and um, construction and presentation to get into composition and color as well. And then from there, um, in your next sort of year of study, you would start to look at the specific materials. You would explore clay or stone or metal, um, textiles. So, um, and then eventually you would start to get to this place of experimenting and really making forward progress with those things. Uh, I love the, the Bauhaus's 
embracing of a multiplicity of media and materials, because I think in American art, we often sort of try to raise up painting and sculpture and, um, you know, other things that are more considered fine arts. And we tend to leave craft a little bit out of it, but I think the Bauhaus really integrated craft into that larger conversation as did Black Mountain College, as does the Asheville Art Museum sort of as a whole, right? That it's hard to separate out those everyday objects in some ways when you start to consider them in an aesthetic sense. So um, I wanna give just a, a little bit of an overview, by no means exhaustive, um, of Joseph Albers teachings first, and then we're gonna look at Ani um, after that and just um, connect some of their teachings to some of the works in the exhibition by other artists who studied with them. So Albers was really influenced obviously by the Bauhaus. He was bringing his years of learning and teaching at the Bauhaus with him. That's not something that you really let go of when you're surrounded by amazing aesthetics and, and thinking and experimentation. Uh, but one of the things that was wonderful about coming to Black Mountain College for him was this uh, progressivism. The ideas that were coming out of progressivism and what John Rice was sort of furthering in terms of John Dewey's ideas of educating the whole person. And so in some ways it didn't necessarily soften, I don't know, that's kind of a funny word to use, I guess, but it did kind of open up the way that um, Albers taught about teaching and engaging with students and engaging with his peers. Uh, it is important to note that he did not speak any English when he and Ani came in 1933 when they were fleeing the Nazi regime. Uh, and so Ani did a lot of the translating for him. Um, <laughs> And uh, she does not get enough credit. She is a dynamo. And there have been some really important exhibitions in the past couple of years that are doing a lot of work to really make sure that her legacy is, is brought up to the stature that it should have. But um, I, I want to give props to her for that, for helping out Yosef <laughs> uh, Alvers. Um, so in addition to this idea of the Bauhaus sort of coming with him, he really invested in this idea of teaching the whole person, right? Um, a sort of famous quote is to open eyes, that's what he wanted to do. Um, and really bring a greater awareness of how people move through their everyday life, right? So a lot of people were not coming to study art, they were actually coming to study other things, but you had to take art classes, um, it was required. So almost anybody who came from the 1933 to 1949 period of Black Mountain College was taking a class with Yosef Albers. Um, other things that were really important to him was an improvisation of materials, although with certain rules in place. Um, and then there are sort of various courses that he would teach about design and color and painting. And so there were a couple of key ideas that I think play out in really visible ways in, in some of the objects in the exhibition that come out of that coursework. So he's very interested in negative space. Like when you start to work in even just black and white, how do those two um, sort of positive and negative space live next to each other? Uh, how do shapes form without using a line? Um, he was also very interested in a sensitivity to formal relationships. So how do things within a composition relate to one another? I mean, did they sit harmoniously, somewhat in contradiction to one another? That I think comes forward very much so in his use of geometry and in squares and triangles and rectangles and such. Um, he also taught explorations of meandering and repeating lines. That repetition section is present in um, the exhibition at the Knoxville Museum of Art, for sure. Uh, he is famed for his writings on color, and certainly he was thinking about that already when he was at Black Mountain College. Um, that treatise was sort of not formalized until later on in his career, but it was absolutely present while there. Um, and then as a result of sort of what he came into um, in this progressivism, in this context of Black Mountain College, was a respect for elements of artworks, right? So how do things sit together, but also for other people, how do we extend that sort of less tangible thing of, of respecting you, what you're making to respecting those around you? And it is important to note that Black Mountain College was very ahead of its time in terms of um, certain social um, issues. It 
um, was integrated in 1944, almost 10 years before Brown versus Education, um, during that summer of 1944 Institute. And there were a lot of conversations among both students and staff about ways that they could be a more inclusive um, community. And Albers certainly, I think, was a, a part of that. It's not to say it was perfect. I always sort of want to, you know, note that there were things that were certainly not, it was, you know, the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, there were things that had not quite gotten to, you know, things that we are still working on today that were present, but they were also, I think, very ahead of their time and very intentional in trying to move some of those social progressive ideas forward as well. So let's get into some artwork. Yay, it's artwork time. Um, so everything I'm showing you is in the exhibition. So you can go see it in person. I really wanted to focus on what you could go see and experience in person so that you could kind of take it in. Um, so in those basic design courses, he would often, like I said, challenge students to look at black and white, um, to be aware of leftover or negative spaces. Um, and Alvarez himself was certainly exploring that. So we see that in this work, Seclusion from 1942, which would have been uh, made while he was at Black Mountain College. This is right after they had moved to Lake Eden. And so, um, you know, you get the sense of rhythm uh, of the white and the black. And I was looking at a similar work closely the other day with um, some students in a virtual visit. And one of the things that they noted was his use of um, weight in line and the way that it starts to sort of, you know, add this sense of vibrancy and also depth to a two-dimensional um, work. And that's really playing on the sort of power of the simplicity of black and white images and um, his exploration of negative space. And here is a later work because I know that um, I've included in the exhibition works not just from the time period at Black Mountain College, although I think a lot of what we'll see today um, is from that time period. But I wanted to include later works because I think it's important to note that folks didn't just go to Black Mountain College, say that was a lot of fun and then forgot about everything that they learned there. Um, the impact of the many people's time at Black Mountain College is really well documented. Um, there's fabulous resources out there um, in the form of books, in the form of some of our um, peer institutions like the uh, Western Regional Archives and the Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center. Shout out to all of the other folks doing great work on Black Mountain College here in the area, making us in Asheville a destination if you want to know more about Black Mountain College. Um, but this later work from the Formulation Articulation um, Folio shows how that idea of line and harmony um, even in sort of an imbalance, right? It's not perfectly symmetrical. There are things that are a little bit off as you start to look at it. Um, continue in his work throughout his career. And he's really well known for his homage to the square series. He comes back again and again to the square and to geometry. And the more that you start to look at these works, the more you see the way that his mind was sort of working through ideas and finding new ways to combine. In this case, we start to see his use of color. Um, that color is always sort of intentional and that there was sort of an intuitiveness to the way that they sat next to one another. It's a little different from the traditional color wheel system of thinking about color, but more intuitive. Um, this undated work by Albert Lanier is sort of another <laughs> variation on that black and white. I'm going to show a couple of those, uh, but I love the, the, the one red E. So a lot of folks would um, work a little more abstractly, but they would also play with um, using numbers or letters to, to kind of ground their exploration. And so this is such a kind of fun op art type piece um, by Albert Lanier, but um, it really, it, it gets at what Albert's would call like a swindle where your eye was tricked a little bit. Um, and so this idea of repetition starts to form dimensionality too, because he's working on a grid system, which um, I'll talk about with Ani Alvers and her weaving and that, uh, the impact of that. But um, just to, to show some of the variations of the ways that these might've been explored. Um, 
So here we've got um, Lorna playing Halper, um, her linear dance, which is a little bit later. But um, again, I want to show sort of the, this lasting impact where she's again playing with the sense of black and white lines, right? So the line drawings that I was mentioning where, you know, attending to the way that lines come together within a work um, was one of those key studies that Albers was asking st students to do. I've got a couple of questions. Sorry, I didn't see that guy. Um, the, some of these are good questions for, for me to d dip in on right now so that you have the context as I keep talking. Um, how did they know about, Mountain Co about Black Mountain College and who hired them? Um, so Yvonne asked that question. They were hired by um, John Rice, and I'm actually kind of blanking on how he found out about them, but they had recently left in, uh, Germany and they were kind of looking for work and he was like, come on down. I have got this thing I'm trying out because they were there pretty soon after he started the college. They came in, I think, December of 1933. So not long after they showed up. Um, I don't know if they were pulling their own prints when they were at Black Mountain College. Um, uh, I don't think so. Yosef was working with uh, Biltmore Press. And then later on, the... Um, the, the articulation, uh, formulation articulation folio here, um, he did that in collaboration with Sewell Silman, who was also at Black Mountain College and then moved up to Connecticut and was an incredible master printer. There's a um, watercolor by him in the exhibition um, that you can go see. I'm gonna save that question for a minute. Um, there was also certainly, I think, exercises in drawing from life and attending to um, sort of the way that line functioned in those ways. Uh, this is a later work by Laurie Goulet um, showing these sort of quick sketches of figures. And I, I um, the next couple of slides are really thinking about the influence of interdisciplinarity and movement and the way that that played into folks experience that they were um, looking at one another um, as inspiration. Um, and so these sort of really dynamic, wonderful, quick sketches are maybe a little more traditional in a way, and yet still capturing that spirit of, of, of line and movement. And I think that really comes across in this later work by um, Marion Prager Simon, who was not there at the same time as Albers. But I think it's important to note that even after he left in 1949, Joseph Fiore, who was his student, was still teaching there. And so there was, I think, a continued legacy and some of those things that he taught certainly weren't just like gone when he left because there was such a, a legacy. Uh, and so there's a number of these wonderful drawings by Marion Prager Simon uh, in our collection. And um, she was a founding member of the Merce Cunningham Dance Company, which sort of had its origin officially in 1953 at Black Mountain College when Merce Cunningham came down with a group of dancers. Um, and she did these really kind of great gestural line drawings that really seemed to capture that, that physicality of, of working with the simplicity of a line on paper. I mean, they're, they're almost like a little dance across the paper. Uh, but on the left uh, is a photograph by Clemens Kalisher, who was passing through in 1948 uh, after coming down on assignment to photograph the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And he took some photographs of some of the very sort of interdisciplinary actions that were happening um, while the Albers were on campus campus. And I, um, I include these two because, you know, they weren't just imparting information on other people. They were also receiving information from those people who were around them. And so Mars Cunningham came to teach in 1948 and, um, certainly would have been, uh, you know, everyone on campus would have been aware of the performances that were happening on site and the, you know, dancers were out in the, in the, in the dining. I mean, the thing is, is the dining hall at the um, studies building. That was what they used as their stage. Uh, the studies building had a dining hall and it had um, individual studios for all the students, but, you know, you, you kind of couldn't escape it. Um, and so this sense of gesture through movement, I think, ha had sort of a, a, a reverse, you know, influence on both Ani and Yosef Albers. There are quite a few of these um, watercolors in our collection, and they're one of the very specific studies that were assigned in those courses 
that Albers was teaching. Um, this one was really about the use of color. And as I mentioned, not using line, right? So we're relying entirely on color and shape to create an image of, of, of what we're looking at. They're not just sort of abstract. They were always a still life or a portrait of some kind. And so in this really great 1945-ish um, watercolor by Elaine Schmidt or Bain, um, we can sort of see the shapes of the violin start to come together by her very, you know, careful use of, of color here, right? We get the, the dimensionality and the shape of the violin and it sort of floats on this ethereal rainbow of colors. They're always so colorful, but it was attending to the way that colors would work in, in sort of tandem with one another to then make our eyes sort of put the picture together. Um, and here's a couple of paintings that I think really, really, really show Alvarez's influence. Um, you really get a sense of that. Um, I don't know. Again, it's not quite harmony, but that that um, living side by side of colors to really make the image come together. These are obviously abstract. Um, they're about line. They're about form. They're about shape and the way that they fit together. Uh, but they are doing so in a way that... Um, are really quite interesting to look at. Uh, these are student works. Obviously, these both artists went on to have extensive careers, very productive careers um, throughout you know the many years that followed their time at Black Mountain College. But I think when you start to look at both Lorna um, Halper's later work and um, Pete Jenner John's later work, you still see these elements of um, what they were doing under Albers and his influence. And in fact, we have uh, works from I think like 2012 by Pete Jenner John that are actually coming back around again to the same question of how do colors kind of hang out with one another? How do forms fit together? Um, so I think, I don't know, I feel like maybe everybody had to have their own little homage to the square-esque moment <laughs> after having such a, an influence of Albers upon them. Um, and so I mentioned Joseph Fiore earlier, who was one of those students who then became an instructor. And this work is from 1950. So at this point, he had taken over the painting program. He had studied both with Joseph Albers and with um, Ilya Bolotovsky, who sort of was there when the transition happened. Um, when, when Albers left in 1949. Um, and so I think you can still see in this abstraction, the ways in which color theory is playing. This is a fairly, I mean, it's fairly monochromatic, right? There, there's a dominance of these warmer colors with pops of, of cooler colors, but um, you know, he's thinking about the way that shape and form come together to find that abstraction. Um, and so it also has some influences of Balatovsky, but you can see how in this work, Fiore as an instructor is carrying forward that legacy of what Albers was teaching in his classes. And then here's a little friend that I hope is familiar to you all from your collection, um, which is also, you know, kind of tying into this exhibition. Uh, Ray Johnson is really well known for kind of being the inventor of male art, right? So he would, um, basically make the US postal system a, a party in his art making. And he would send things back and forth via the mail. Um, and he really kind of has his roots in that while he was at Black Mountain College. He was sending letter, he was sending letters to Lorna Vlaine Halper. He was, you know, really starting this whole idea of correspondence as a work of art while he was there. Um, and I think this idea of using what you have or using the tools at hand was something that was essential to what was being taught by both Joseph and Ani Albers. And that was in part due to the fact that they were in this amazing natural setting with many readily available materials and that they also had a shortage of materials, particularly during, you know, the sort of World War II period. Um, and the fact that the you know, there wasn't a lot of money for supplies either. So there was a lot of working with what you had, which I think led to this sense of experimentation even more so than what was already being sort of asked of you. You were kind of taking it a step further based on what was available. This is what I want to come see in person too. I want to, I want to check out both the Ray Johnson and the Robert Rauschenbergs that you all have in your collection. So that's a kind of an overview of um, Yes Albers and some of the things that he was teaching. And we're gonna take a moment to now switch gears to what Ani was doing. Um, 
obviously impact of Bauhaus paired with progressivism is certainly still very important. She, um, she, um, was really important at the Bauhaus because they kind of had weaving and then she came in and she like made it a thing. Uh, she really established a program there and was, you know, really thinking about it in terms of what the Bauhaus was really about. And then she brought it with her, established an amazing weaving studio. I, I would say that even if students weren't officially taking weaving, again, they were exposed to it. Um, they were thinking about this, this unique um, nature of textile design and production. Um, for her, she was really interested in students focusing on te technique, um, that they were really attending to the materials that were, they were working with. Um, and within that sort of expanding what fiber-based techniques could be um, and, and finding natural materials. Again, there was a little bit of a, what do we have on hand and how can we make it work? So she started incorporating some very much so found materials, both from nature and from industrial sources into her work while at Black Mountain College. Um, as much as she worked on loom, she was also very interested in handwork and that sort of tactile um, haptic experience of making. Um, and she was also sort of interested in the grid, um, both as it's defined by, you know, the warp and the weft, the two directions that are on a, a loom when you're weaving, uh, but also freeing oneself from the grid. Um, and so, um, you can see here in this work from um, the Connections portfolio, it is a little bit meandering. It almost looks like a thread kind of dancing across the page. And what I think is great about this work is that it's actually a design that she um, came up with in 1948, and it wasn't printed until 1983. So um, this work in many ways sort of predates when it was actually produced. Um, she was sort of thinking in this abstract, free from the grid way early on in her, her career. Which, you know, kind of can compare with the similar work with verticals from the connection portfolio. Um, and I don't know if it's coming through on your screen, but there's almost like a, a herringbone type pattern. Um, you know, that kind of goes boop, 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 and then all of these little punctuations. And this work is really kind of interesting. Um, it's obviously a screen print, but um, it adheres to that verticality and horizontal um, nature of working on a loom. Um, I mean, I, I reference herringbone, which is a type of fabric. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting thing that I don't have a great example of really, you know, in our collection, but John Cage, who was there several times and overlapped with the Alberts, was really inspired by the way that she played with what a loom could be and how it functioned. So she would sort of alter the way that a loom would traditionally work. And similarly, John Cage would take a piano. He was you know, a great pianist um, and he would... Uh, attach and clamp down and do all kinds of different things to uh, prepare the piano so that it sounded different than a piano normally would. And so it was the same idea of sort of playing with string in very different ways that they were both uh, coming to. But I think as you start to look at the works of other uh, Black Mountain College artists, you can see how this um, influence of the, the aesthetic qualities of textiles begin to influence the way that end visuals work. So in this work by William Albert Lanier, it has that almost cloth-like feeling to it. He is on a grid, right? We kind of get the sense of, of there being sections to it, and yet it's starting to play with it to add that freedom um, of movement to what is really a rigid structure. We certainly can't talk about weaving without talking about Ruth Asawa um, and her amazing baskets. She went with the Albers to Mexico in 1947, and that's where she discovered this technique of um, woven wire that was being used for egg baskets down in Mexico. And she really, um, you know, took it from this very uh, small, um, beautifully woven form of copper wire, which is not a traditional material. Like this, this is not a normal sculptural material. It's, it's an industrial everyday material. And, um, you know, took it to this great place of these extremely delicate, airy, complex woven um, sculptures that sell for an incredible amount of money nowadays because she was just really 
you know, so far ahead of her time, but, you know, she was also looking at Cherokee baskets and, and the way that those are woven in really unique patterns. So between the influence of Ani Albers or experience in Mexico and seeing traditional Cher Cherokee materials, she sort of grew out of that, this amazing um, body of work that she's so well known for today. Um, there's a question about sort of a, a protege of sorts. I don't know if there's a specific protege that one can really call out of Ani Alvers. That comes to the top of my mind, although I, I, some of my colleagues who are more knowledgeable about her might be able to pop that in and, you know, they would, they would know more. But um, she certainly influenced folks and quite a few people became... Um, Textile artists. So Ani Albers would go on to design for Knoll textiles in a sort of industrial capacity. Uh, and so did Laura Lindenfeld, who was one of her students. Um, this is a 1982 work uh, by Laura Lindenfeld, but you can see, I think, the influence of both Ani and Yosef very clearly in this work. It's really a, a wonderful piece, um, a mixture of wool and ribbons, um, where she's thinking about color, she's thinking about lines, she's thinking about the way that forms are fitting together and living in harmony, uh, and went on to, again, have a very successful career as a, as a fabric um, and textile designer. But um, here is a smaller work. Um, so this is a, a Matière study from some time around 1945, 1948. And the Matière study was something that both Yosef and Ani really kind of incorporated into their teaching. So Matière focused on materials, materiality. Uh, and so both of them were really interested. Again, Ani would incorporate natural materials into the weavings that she was making. Um, particularly at the Blue Ridge Assembly, um, artists would go out and, and pull things from the woods around them. And then, you know, they kind of carried that. Um, there's a lot of uh, famous leaf studies. We have a small petal collage on view here um, with us, although that's kind of a tiny, sweet little precious thing that uh, we haven't quite gotten ready to travel, um, but do have on view. And so folks would go out and they would incorporate these multiple materials into sort of finding um, the resulting, or it was all about exploring. It was all about experimenting. Um, I guess when you don't have grades, that's maybe nice. You don't have that pressure. <laughs> um, although certainly there were critiques and reviews and conversations that were born out of every object that, you know, folks would make. Um, but this rubbing, um, is really looking at uh, the, the at wood grain, right? So it's almost like you can see how she's come at it from a couple different angles, right? It's almost like this is the same form repeated and it starts to form this really beautiful composition. Um, and it almost has a, a textile print, like not necessarily woven textile, but like a print like quality um, to it. And it's almost a reverse of a traditional printing matrix, right? It's rather than putting something onto the paper, you're putting the paper on top of the thing that you're taking um, that texture off of. Um, but certainly an artist who was influenced by both of them. And um, these Matière studies are very interesting because you see the way that folks are looking to the world around them, the way that they're incorporating every element of, of their experience into what they're making. So I think I've talked for a good hot minute here. Um, so let's maybe open it up to some questions. Yeah, so now we're ready for questions. So we'll go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to flip back to any objects that you want to look at more closely or talk about more. Um, I have a hundred more. I'm not, well, I'm not quite kidding. I have like 60 more slides tucked into this presentation <laughs> um, on the back end of it. So there's certainly more materials or we can go back and look more closely at other things. Um, but yeah, happy to open it up to conversation and questions. We did have one in the chat that came through a little bit ago about, um, Robert Ruschenberg's relationship with uh, Joseph Albers and how he hoped Albers could make him less lazy in his work. Can you elaborate on that? I actually don't know that story, to be honest. Uh, it's, you know... We all um, at our institution spend a lot of time with Black Mountain College. It's not the only thing we focus on, but we spend a lot of time with it. And so there's always things that I, I haven't heard about that I'm, I'm finding that are new and exciting. Like just the other day, we discovered that Albers, Yusuf Albers had designed a font while at the Bauhaus. Uh, didn't know that, which was kind of exciting and fun um, to, to come across. But I'm actually not familiar with that story. Although um, I would say that 
Susan Weil, who was Rauschenberg's wife at the time, I think kind of made him go with her down there, right? So she was a student, he was a student. Um, and so she kind of pulled him down there with her. Uh, I would say that even though there was a lack of, of certain structures that are present in a lot of academic institutions, uh, there were certainly still structures present at Black Mountain College. Um, I think it in some ways is more traditional sometimes than people want to believe it is. But Albert certainly had rules and expectations and and a set of, of you know, barriers in which to make, or not barriers, but um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like boundaries or whatever. Like, you know, there, there was context to making. So I could see how Rauschenberg would feel that having those very specific um, pointed assignments could could help give some structure to what he himself was actually focusing on well, and doing. And Hillary, excuse me for jumping in, but sure. I, as someone who's just learning about Black Mountain, which is such a great story, it's a great American story and a great Appalachian story. Um, I'm not surprised it only lasted a few decades. I don't know how it lasted for one day. I know, right? I mean, it, it, the, the whole sort of chaotic express yourself, be free, I just, it seems miraculous that it, that it, that it lasted so long and it did as much as it did. I, I would love, I would love to get into, and maybe it didn't, didn't cost much back in the thirties to keep something like that going or mm, well, that, that completely fascinates me as an administrator. Like, well, how did you, right. <laughs> how did you pay the, how they pay the bills? Mm -hmm. Well, it helps that they had a couple folks who had been educators in a formal context, right? John Rice, Ted Dreyer, Bob Wunsch, all of these like sort of founding figures had worked in traditional academic settings, right? They were coming from places and that's actually what they were kind of bucking against a little bit. Um, for them, you know, having a ready-made campus where they didn't have to necessarily like build a building uh, was really important. Although they did have to leave in the summers from the assembly because they would have programming in camp. So everybody would back up and clear out in the summertime or they would kind of continue renting to- Whose they, assembly they, was that? Um, it's was run it by the YMCA. Uh, it was founded in 1906. And so actually it's pretty neat that um, th they, it was a pretty new space. It was barely 20 years old when they yeah. moved in in 1933. I mean, and I growing I, up as a Southern Baptist, we would go to Ridgecrest mm -hmm. right down the road in the summer and, yeah. and loved it. it so it's a classic assembly style. I mean, it, the building yeah. is huge. It's it's classic like Southern assembly. Um, there's a bunch of them in the area. So I think having like not to like fork out money for a building. Everybody knows buildings are expensive. Uh, if if you're in a in large institution, you've probably been through a capital campaign before. Uh, so they did have to do that. And they sent out all kinds of crazy brochures to try to raise money. The fact that everybody was lending a hand to complete the work was part of what made it work. Um, in the 1940s, which were really productive years, on one hand, um, it was a lot of women who were able to come during the war years and really kept the place going. Uh, but then after that, the GI Bill was huge. Um, a lot of support came from the GI Bill, but it was really just, you know, people paying tuition and trying to kind of be scrappy about fundraising. Um, they were definitely enthusiastic in their fundraising campaigns. Uh, we have some of those materials and there's a lot, I think both Black Mountain College Museum and Art Center and um, the Western Regional Archives. So, you know, between the three institutions, we've got a great picture of that. But that's kind of why it fell apart because the leadership didn't have maybe the the structure that it needed towards the end there. And they just kind of ran out of money and um, Camp Rockmont, which is a boys camp that um, purchased the, the college in 1956, kind of let people hang out long enough to um, wrap things up. And then in the summer of 1957, it was like, all right. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's kind of miraculous that it happened at all. Um, and for as long as it did, um, and, and that we we're left with such an incredible legacy, but I, I can't imagine. And they actually, they had really like well put together catalogs that were very thorough that, you know, listed the courses and, um, you know, a lot of the materials from it, uh, the ephemera are very professional and, <clears throat> and nice. So yeah, David Silver, um, Carissa, I know Carissa is one of my colleagues um, over at Black Mountain College Museum and Art Center. 
And um, yeah, David Silver is doing really wonderful research on the farm in the war years. And um, so um, he's somebody to check out. I've passed his name along to a couple of folks that have been interested, particularly in the farm. Um, but I, I'm always fascinated by the war years and how they got by. And, um, you know, we like to, again, think of it as this little tiny place existing off in the middle of nowhere, but they were affected just as much as everybody else by the, the, the times in which they lived. Yeah, Hillary, I've got a question about um, Ani and Yosef and their relationship. You, you look at that Barbara Morgan photograph of them, they almost look like twins. And you look at their work, there seems to be this common spirit in their work. I'm just curious, is that the way it was interpersonally or did they have a lot of, of times where they were uh, in conflict about the direction of the art curriculum at Black Mountain? I'm just curious about their interpersonal dynamic. Um, I'm trying to, okay. Well, I was gonna try to share that picture again and my computer's being a little stubborn right now. Um, I don't actually know that much about their interpersonal relationship. I, I know that there are some records of, of Yosef being not the easiest person to always work with. Um, I definitely feel like it's a classic, extremely talented um, partner who is overshadowed by um, her, her, you know, her, her partner. So um, yeah, I mean, again, it was still the 1950s, even though women were helping out and they were, you know, wearing shorts and t-shirts and all of that. It certainly um, was a little bit, you know, again, I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to misspeak on what their dynamics were, but. Um, even woke people then let, there were certain roles for women. Yes. Let's say. Yeah. Well, and that's like kind of what happened at the Bauhaus, Donnie Albers. It was like, well, you're a woman, so you're going to teach weaving. Yeah. And then she did amazing things with it. Right. So this class, like, you know, the classic of like thriving, even despite oppression. Um, but, um, you know, I think that she would go on to do pretty amazing things when she came to the United States. Do you feel that Black Mountain was more open to letting women be more explorative of their arts and different fields? I think so. Um, and there were men who took weaving courses too. So don't, you know, you know, I think it's important to, to you know, note that it was not just women who were, you know, taking courses um, in that area. But um, I do think it was more exploratory. I mean, women were coming to take painting, which, you know, in, in many places was considered a masculine art. Um, they were doing you know, sculptural works. And then particularly after Albers left, there was a flourishing of a ceramics program that was actually headed by uh, a couple of women, including Karen Carnes and MC Richards. And there's some Karen Carnes works in the exhibition. Um, Albers didn't really like ceramics. It happened at Black Mountain, but to him, based on what he wanted to teach, it wasn't really an ideal media for the various um, teachings that he was giving in his courses, although I think there's a very strong argument to be made that you can certainly still teach um, a la Albers using a medium like clay. I agree. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you, Hillary, so much. You have done an exquisite job yet again. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming along for all the things, Kitsy. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Hillary. I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit envious that y'all have this kind of treasure there, and there's just there's so much there and so much to dig into and so much to work on. And I, I thank you for sharing it with us. And well, I hope we'll I hope we'll continue to 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 kind of dip in there once once in a while. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's again a rich, rich um, set of materials that we have, um, and again across the region, there's a couple of us that have some really great, great things, um, and if we certainly have some big projects related to Black Mountain College and the wor works. We're working on um, digitizing the collection and making it available, um, all 1300 plus objects and uh, doing sort of an extensive timeline that'll link you to a lot of resources um, about Black Mountain College. And we have a couple more. There's always a Black Mountain College exhibition in the works while um, for the future. Um, my colleague, Whitney Richardson, our associate curator is working on an exhibition that focuses on um, the legacy of design from Bauhaus as it influenced Black Mountain. In college. So um, 
that is coming up in a little bit here and it's going to be another great regional offering of Black Mountain College stuff. But uh, we're envious of your your Buford Delaney work. So we're really thrilled that they're going to be coming here for a little bit. We can't, I can't wait to see how those, how all those things look in your space, your beautiful mm -hmm. spaces. So we're going to, we're going to be there. Yes. Hopefully, Shots hopefully are coming. So. Yes, they are. <laughs> um, but yeah, as, as Delena mentioned in the comments, uh, there's going to be a talk on Tuesday, March 30th with Lydia C, who was our curatorial fellow working on Black Mountain College materials. She's going to be talking about the ephemera and working with archives, um, sort of in the context of how we look at them in an art institution. It's a bit of a unique thing for us to have so many documents um, related to Black Mountain College, uh, but they're an important part of interpretation as we can see through their presence in a couple of exhibitions. So should be a great talk. She's wonderful. Um, and so hope you'll join for that as well. Thank you, Holly. I appreciate you giving my plug for me, so I don't have Welcome. to. <laughs> but thanks. No, I'm really looking forward to it, and I appreciate everything you had to say. The Albers are such fascinating um, influencers. Okay, well, thank you so much, Hillary, and thank, thank you, you, everyone, for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.